In August of 2017, something remarkable happened involving things called neutron stars. So neutron stars are these, some of the strangest stars in the universe. They weigh more than the mass of the sun, but they're only the size of Kitchener Waterloo. They're like 25, 30 kilometers across, but they weigh more than the mass of the sun. So they're some of the densest objects in the universe. And if you think one neutron star is pretty incredible, well, imagine two of them orbiting each other and then crashing into each other. And that's what we saw in August of 2017. So here's an artist's impression of what we saw, two neutron stars spiraling in faster and faster and then eventually coalescing, possibly forming a black hole and creating a spectacular uh, explosion. And while we didn't see the moment of the explosion itself, because we didn't know it was about to happen, this explosion actually was so violent that it made the entire universe shake. It's like the granddaddy of all earthquakes. Uh, so we live, our universe is a mixture of space and time, space time, and the actual fabric of space time itself vibrated across the entire universe when these two neutron stars merged. And we actually felt that happen. You and I didn't uh, feel that happen. You weren't sitting there eating a sandwich on that day and think, oh, what was that? Um, but we have, uh, the vibration was tiny. It was like smaller than the diameter of an atom. But we have these incredibly sensitive uh, instruments, uh, one in Washington and one in Louisiana, uh, called LIGO, and they detected the vibration from these two neutron stars merging, and literally the entire universe shook for a few seconds after that, which is quite extraordinary. And as I said, I'm pretty sure that this is one thing that didn't turn up in science fiction before it happened in real life, but if you know better, I'd be happy to be corrected. Okay, so science fiction is normally ahead of the game, and you know, given that my talk is on warp drive and aliens, it's not gonna be a shock to you to tell you that science fi fiction is ahead of the game here too. So um, warp drive is really all about traveling from one place to another quickly. We know that stars are unbelievably far away. The nearest star to us is 40 trillion kilometers away. So getting from one star to another is not super practical. And in science fiction, you sort of want people to be able to go to other stars, to travel around and have adventures, so you have to have some, some cheat, some way of getting from one star to another. And normally, uh, science fiction doesn't worry about the details too much. Uh, they just invent warp drive or hyperdrive or something, and that's just a convenient way of getting from A to B. So in, in the movies, it's super easy to travel from one star to the other. So here's a scene from Return of the Jedi, Admiral Akbar, may he rest in peace. Um, and here we go, traveling from one star to another. So easy, and they pop out, <laughs> pop out two seconds later and they're at another star system. Um, so of course in real life, I'm not giving away anything to tell you it's not that simple. So if we want to be able to you know, live the life of science fiction and travel to other stars, how might we actually do it? So old school science fiction is you have a rocket ship. So here's a real rocket ship and here's a science fiction version. Uh, could you build a rocket ship and use it to travel to another star? So the short answer is not really. Um, the way the space shuttle worked is it has, it's full of fuel and you light that fuel and you get a massive explosion, you direct the explosion out the back and the, the gas flows out that way and you get a reaction. If you push the gas out that way, you go that way. Okay, so it's very simple, brute force technology uh, and it pushes the space shuttle up into space. Now, the space shuttle is really, really big. Who's actually seen the space shuttle at one of the museums? Anyone seen it? It's huge, right? Um, and if, have any of you been to the one in Florida where they actually had the boosters as well? Anyone been to Cape Canaveral? It, these boosters are even bigger than the space shuttle. So you get a feeling you've got this massive multi-story building just full of rocket fuel, and that's what you need to launch the space shuttle. But the space shuttle, and this is sort of a bit embarrassing because it's not really a space shuttle. It doesn't really, it barely goes into space. The space shuttle only went up 300 kilometers. That's not even from here to Ottawa. So it's a very short distance, and that you needed all this incredible fuel just to get 300 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So you still haven't even escaped from the Earth's gravity, let alone escape the sun, let alone travel to another star. So even if you could build a rocket that, uh, you, that had everything you needed on it to travel to another star, uh, and you built the fastest rocket that's ever been built, um, it would take about 20,000 years to get even to the nearest star. 
So not only does that not make for great TV on a science fiction movie, um, it's obviously not very practical. If you want to travel 20,000 years, that's you know, many, many generations. You're going to need thousands of people and food and radiation shielding and schools and all the rest of it. You're going to have a, a spaceship the size, bigger than a cruise ship, and that's just not practical. If you really cut everything down to the bare, bare, bare minimum, you could, the calculations have been done that you could build a, a, a very small, hyped up, super powered rocket that could get to the nearest star in 900 years. That's still a pretty long time. And there's a few problems with that. Firstly, that's to get to the star, but of course, you're traveling very fast when you get to that star and you've used up all your fuel, so you have no way of slowing down. So you finally get to the star, it's like, bye, and that's the end of that. So not very practical, but even that would take 900 years. And what's more, you'd need more matter than there is in the entire solar system. Uh, to do it. And so you can imagine how big the rocket boosters would have to be. So while I love pictures like this, this is just simply not never going to be a practical way of traveling between stars. Just the amount of fuel you need is just completely impractical. So let's look at options that don't require so much fuel. There's another alternative called the ion drive. Uh, it sounds uh, like science fiction, but it's actually real. And it simply involves using electricity like a battery or something even nuclear-powered or solar-powered electricity to slowly evaporate a lump of fuel and gently blow out your fuel uh, at, at the other end. So uh, you use much less fuel, but you shoot out the individual ions much, much faster. And so this is an artist's impression of uh, a satellite probe called uh, Dawn that was used by NASA, um, and it visited two asteroids, Vesta and Ceres, and it traveled 6.9 billion kilometers over 11 years. And it traveled that 6.9 billion kilometers using only 400 kilograms of fuel. So that's nothing. Like, that's just a big block of fuel about this big. Um, it used xenon, so just a big tank of xenon gas weighing 400 kilograms, which is not that much compared to the space shuttle. Uh, and that's all it needed to travel billions of kilometers over 11 years. And if you think that sort of looks too good to be true, like this just looks like it's artistic license and there's nothing really like that, here's a, a photograph of an ion drive in the lab and it looks exactly like the artist's impression. So these things actually work and there have actually been many satellites now that have flown around the solar system using these ion drives. The problem with the ion drive is that it's really, really weak. It's a very gentle thrust. So if you're shopping to buy a fancy car, a Porsche or a Lamborghini, um, it might be important to you to know how fast it takes to go from zero to 100. Um, and uh, the most expensive cars that you can buy these days go from zero to 100 in a little less than three seconds. So if you walked into the showroom and pointed at NASA Dawn and said, what can I get out of this baby? Um, well, the answer might disappoint you because it goes from zero to 100 in four days. Um, <laughs> So the acceleration is really, really weak. It takes a long time to get up to speed. So that's the price you pay for not having to need much fuel, is that you don't get a lot of oomph out of it. Um, and so if you tried to use the ion drive to travel to another star, even to the nearest star, it would take you 80,000 years to get there. Again, not very practical. There's another problem. As I said, the ion drive is super weak. So you could not put this thing on the ground and say, ready for takeoff, three, two, one, go. Nothing would happen. It's too weak to escape the Earth's gravity. So you still need all of those rocket boosters to get it out of the Earth's orbit. And only then can you turn on the ion drive. So this is probably not a very practical solution either. What about if we get rid of the engine completely and use an energy source that isn't attached to the spacecraft? Could this solve our problems? So this has been thought of too. Uh, it's been around in science fiction for a very long time. Uh, and the idea is to use uh, what are called solar sails. And the theory here is that the sun actually is blowing off this gentle wind in every direction. The solar wind, it's traveling at quite a high speed, these flow of particles in every direction. So as long as you want to travel away from the sun and not towards it, you simply have to unfurl a big sail and it will fill up just like uh, the sail of a ship and it, you'll be blown away from the sun. And just like a sailor, you can use various tricks, tacking and all the rest of it if you don't want to travel directly away. So here is a solar sail uh, being used by Count Dooku in Star Wars Attack of the Clones, and here is sort of the classical old school 1950s science fiction version of a solar sail. So could we use a solar sail to sail out of the solar system on the sun's wind? Um, and the answer is, well, maybe. Um, 
There's also, remember the problem I mentioned before is having to slow down when you get to the other star? Well, it's perfect. You use the sun, solar wind to sail halfway to the star you're going to, then you turn the whole thing around, and you use the wind of the other star to, uh, to slow down, and then you go to a gentle stop when you want to go there. So people are actually working on this technology. Um, here is uh, uh, a spacecraft called LightSail 2 that was developed by the Planetary Society. The space probe itself is really, really tiny. It's just in there. It's only about this big. But the sail is huge. It's about uh, 30 square meters, or about 350 square feet. So this thing was actually launched about six months ago. Here it is. Uh, this is a, a photograph from the probe. So you can see this is Baja, California down here in Mexico in the United States. This is the probe. And here is the actual solar sail unfurling. So this was in June of, of last year. Uh, so of course, the big question is, does this actually work? And the answer is, yes, it does. Um, so they, left, they un unfolded the sail, and they measured whether the sun's wind actually pushed this satellite into a new orbit. Uh, but the results are not exactly spectacular. So this is before they unfurled the sail. It was 725.6 kilometers above the Earth's surface. They opened the sail right here. Not much happened for a few days. But then very gently, the solar wind pushed it to 727 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So this is the first time anyone's really done this, and it did work. It raised the orbit of this spacecraft by 1.8 kilometers. Um, you've got to start somewhere. Uh, so clearly, we have a very, very long way to go here. Uh, there's lots more technology we have to develop in order to be able to use solar sails. And the sails are going to have to be much bigger. They're going to have to be hundreds of kilometers across. And then you have the whole technological problem of how do you pack the sail up when you launch the thing? How do you unfurl it? How do you spin the thing around? What happens if like a meteorite rips a hole in it? There's all sorts of huge challenges. But if you can work out how long it would take to get to near a star using solar sailing, and the answer isn't actually too bad. It's only 75 years. Now, that's still a long time. It's, you know, you're not going, if you start as a young man or woman at the beginning, you're probably not going to be alive at the end of it. But 75 years, we're actually starting to get into the right ballpark. Unfortunately, there's really no way to go any faster. Uh, you can't you know, crank up the sun or crank down the sun. The sun is the sun, and it gives out wind at a particular speed. But there is at least a way that you know, is, a, is not complete science fiction, because it works over 1.8 kilometers. We just have to get it working over 40 trillion kilometers, and we are in business. And we can travel to another star using no fuel at all in 75 years. But maybe we should be thinking outside the box and thinking a bit harder. Um, well, there are some other options. Uh, one that comes up a lot uh, is this idea of something called the EM drive, or the Mark Effect thruster. Um, did anyone see this show last year, Salvation? Anyone see this? Probably, you're probably not admitting you want to see it, because it was really bad. Uh, <laughs> filmed here in Toronto, though. And uh, uh, there was a lot of technology in it. And one of them was this idea of this EM drive. And the idea here is a little bit hand-wavy. You, you inject microwaves into this cavity, and they bounce around. But they bounce around, they bounce out fast, slightly faster at one end than the other. And you get a tiny amount of thrust. The only problem is, is that um, you really, sh you know, the laws of physics say that you can't get something for nothing, and most people, including me, think that this breaks the laws of physics. Uh, people have claimed that it does produce a thrust, but other people have rebuilt the same experiment and haven't been able to produce it. So this is probably um, complete fiction, but uh, you know, if we can somehow get this to work, then it does perhaps, maybe, if you don't mind breaking a few laws of physics, produce a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of thrust. So, you know, can this go fast enough? No. Does it work? No. Does it obey the laws of physics? No. But you never know. <laughs> OK, are there other options? Again, let's think outside the box. Maybe you shouldn't travel there at all. Wouldn't it be easy to get to another star if you simply um, look at me, you, you break me up into pieces, I've got an arm and some hair and some feet, you pack all that up, you transmit that information to the other star, and then you put me back at the other end. That's all an email is, right? I mean, if I send you an email, um, the, keystro it's not the, key the keyboard doesn't get sent over to you. The computer records what the keystrokes are, it remembers the order I typed them in, and it puts back that information at the other end over the internet, and you get the message that I sent you. So you know, this has a technical name. It's called teleportation. And maybe this is a way to get from one star to another. So no rocket fuel is needed at all. You just have to break me apart into pieces and beam the signal and put me back at the other end. And of course, this has been a staple of science fiction since forever. And of course, the, the most famous example of teleportation, of course, is in Star Trek.
Okay, so in that case, they, they, they probably only teleported over a few hundred or a few thousand kilometers, but if it works over a few thousand kilometers, why can't it just work from one star to the other? So the good news is that teleportation is real. The bad news is at the moment we can only teleport one atom at a time. Um, but it is real, uh, and uh, it's called quantum teleportation in real life, if you want to look it up. And the record for teleportation at the moment involving one atom is teleporting over, 1400, uh, over a, a distance of 1,400 kilometers. There was a Chinese satellite called Micius, and they, they, teleport they teleported an atom from the ground up to the satellite. So the actual atom never moved. All you do is you take one atom and you measure its exact properties, and uh, by measuring, in the process of measuring its properties, you actually mess it up and you lose that information, but you can transmit that state to the, uh, to the spacecraft and you can recreate an atom exactly the same. So the, the atom at the end is, uh, is indistinguishable from the atom at the beginning to all in intents and purposes it's teleportation. Uh, and it turns out to be really useful. It's really important in cryptography and sending uncrackable signals, which is very important in finance and banking and all the rest of it. Um, but can, can this be used to teleport humans? Well. Probably no, and probably not ever. There's, there's a few catches to this in terms of using it for interstellar travel. The first is that you need a receiving station. So you've got to get your receiving station to where you want to teleport to first. So if you want to visit the nearest star via teleportation, you've got to get the receiving station to the nearest star first, and then you go back to all the problems I just discussed. That has to get there through the normal means. Uh, but once you've done that, you're in business, and you then just simply have to scan every aspect, every atom of a human being and transmit that. And that's a bit of a problem, because you can calculate just how, many, how much data you need to describe a human being, an exact copy. You really want it to be exact copy, right? You don't want to teleport there and discover something important missing. Um, so the amount of data you need to scan one human is 300 million trillion trillion gigabytes. That's that's uh, three with 32 zeros at the end of it, gigabytes. So that's, that's you know, a lot of memory sticks. And then if you work out, well, okay, now you have to transmit with a radio signal, you have to actually send that signal to that star. Uh, well, um, at the highest data rates that we have at the moment, it would take you 5,000 trillion years to transmit that information, <laughs> which is 360,000 times the age of the universe. So it would actually be quicker to walk to the nearest star <laughs> than to teleport. Um, so I'd say there are significant barriers to te teleportation. It does not violate the laws of physics. Unbelievably, it doesn't. We can do it. But the practicalities of transmitting even a single human being are absolutely enormous. So I don't think we'll be teleporting anytime soon. Um, all of these uh, methods also suffer from um, something else. And that's another catch, is that you can go really slow, and it can take you a 1,000 years or whatever. If you could figure out using one of these methods going really, really fast, suppose you could build a rocket ship that could travel at half the speed of light, or 80% of the speed of light, or 90% of the speed of light. You'll get there faster, but then you then have another problem, and that's something called time dilation. It's a consequence of Einstein's special theory of relativity. And what it says is that when you go really fast, your clock runs slower than the rest of the universe. And time dilation hasn't come up too much except in really super nerdy science fiction, so you have to dive really deep to find it until Matthew McConaughey came along and saved the day, as he always does. Uh, in the movie Interstellar, we see time dilation. Matthew McConaughey has a young daughter. He goes off, gallivants around the galaxy, and visits black holes and all the rest of it, but despite being an advanced NASA astronaut, didn't seem to know about time dilation. He must have <laughs> been sick that day, because he's rather surprised when he comes back to Earth, and, you know, a month has passed for him, he's still gorgeous, and his young daughter is now an old, old lady. And so this is a real effect. We have demonstrated this with clocks, um, flying clocks at high speeds, comparing to clocks on Earth, and they're very slightly different. So even if you traveled, um, if you traveled say, only half the speed of light, which you, know, you can go a lot faster, it's like a 15% effect. So if you were away for, say, um, 10 years, um, everyone on Earth would be away for 12. But if you want to get somewhere fast, say if you want to go at 90% of the speed of light, it becomes about a factor of two. And if you want to go at 99% of the speed of light, it becomes a factor of seven. So if you went, at if you went on a journey to other stars at 99% of the speed of light, then you might think you're away for 10 years, and when you come back, 70 years have passed. So all, all your friends are, are, have aged or died, technology's particularly, completely different, society's completely different, you're a total fish out of water. So if you're given the chance to go on interstellar travel at high speed, it might be the trip of a lifetime, but it's going to be very lonely and confusing and strange when you come back. Maybe there's one way around all of these things, and that's, of course, in the title of my talk, warp drive. 
So warp drive is a staple of science fiction, and we saw it in, uh, in the Star Wars clip that I showed at the beginning with Admiral Akbar. Uh, but it was also a, a valid scientific idea. And so the idea was developed by a Mexican physicist, Miguel Alcubier, and he is a science fiction fan, and, but thought about you know, how could you actually do this in real life. And the idea is that space is actually um, uh, sh can be stretched and squashed. I can't do it just with my hands like this, but under the right conditions, you can stretch and squash space. And you can use that to actually move from one place to the other without using uh, any rocket fuel at all. So the idea is that suppose I have um, a big rug, and I, want, and I put a toy car on my rug all the way over here. And I want to get that toy car over to me standing over here. So one way I can do it is I can walk over the toy car and I can hold it and I can wheel it across the rug to me. So that is like a rocket ship using up fuel. But there's another way I can do it. I can put the toy car on the rug over there and then I can just grab the rug and I can bunch up the rug and pull it towards me and then the car will eventually get to me. The car, as far as it can tell, has not moved at all. The wheels have not turned, it hasn't had to use any energy and yet the car has traveled from over there to over here. And that's exactly the idea behind warp drive, except it's using actual space instead of the carpet. And so the idea is you have some sort of spaceship. It doesn't have to use any fuel at all. Uh, but if you squeeze the space ahead of it and stretch the space behind it, you can actually move it from one part of the universe to another, in principle, as fast as you want, without using up any fuel. Now, of course, you have to use energy, but the energy doesn't have to actually be on the spaceship. So this is, in principle, a way of traveling uh, two other stars without having to worry about time dilation or huge amounts of fuel or anything. There's only one small problem. We have absolutely no idea how to actually squash or stretch space-time. And if we did, it would require more energy than all the energy on Earth put together. But other than that minor detail, um, this is theoretically possible. And, you know, there are, if something is theoretically possible, you know, what do they say? You know, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Maybe thousands of years from now, the Alcubier drive will become reality. Okay, so this has been a bit of a downer. I've told you all the ways in which we will never visit other stars, but all hope is not lost. I'm going to finish this part of my talk by telling you one way in which we really might be able to visit other stars. And this is a program that is, is a real program that's in its early days, that's probably only about five or ten years old, called Breakthrough Starshot. And what Breakthrough Starshot says is, let's forget humans traveling to other stars. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and let's forget sending some giant space probe to another star. But what if we had a space probe that was only this big? If you have a spice probe that's only like, you know, uh, the size of a grain of rice, then it doesn't need much fuel at all to, uh, to get to another star. Uh, and, well, how, you can actually get it going quite fast uh, in lots of ways. And, uh, of course, the best sounding way and the way they're pro proposing to use it, of course, is using giant space lasers. Um, so the idea is, is you have your giant space lasers. Here they are. Uh, all ready to shoot their laser, and then somewhere above in Earth orbit, you have a tiny little spacecraft, which is right at the center here, with a big sail around it. And then you fire up your space lasers, you aim them very, very carefully, um, and you focus them all to exactly the right spot, and they hit the sail, here we go, and accelerate this tiny little probe up to enormous speeds, up to 20% of the speed of light, or about 60,000 kilometers a second. At that speed, you can travel to the nearest star in 20 years, you can't slow down, but you fly past that star at great speed, you've got just a few minutes to take a few snapshots, hopefully they're in focus and you're pointing in the right direction, and if there's a planet there, then you get a couple of snapshots and you beam them back to Earth before flying out into the void forever. So it's not the same as being there, just getting a few postcards, but it's better than nothing, and this is perhaps the only viable way in our lifetimes we will travel to another star. As I said, these space lasers could accelerate that tiny little spacecraft up to 20% of the speed of light, and at that speed it takes 20 years to get to the nearest star. You have to wait a little bit longer than that, because the nearest star is four light years away. And what that means is it takes 20 years for the spacecraft to get there, and then when it takes that photo and beams it back to us using radio waves, it takes another four years for the signal to get back to us. But from launch to getting the, the picture is about 24 years. So that's, that's not too bad. You know, hopefully most of us will be around in 24 years and you'd actually get to see the results. So are we ready to do this? Well, not quite. There's a, a bunch of different problems to solve, like building giant space lasers. Um, but probably the biggest challenge is in having that tiny little probe. And there is work going on on this. This is called a femtosatellite, because we already had uh, microsatellites and nanosatellites, so we had to go down to femto, um, femtosatellites. This is a real satellite. It's called Kicksat. 
It's about um, three centimeters across, and it weighs four grams. And it has uh, all the basics of a space probe on it. It has solar power. Um, it has a few probes to measure whatever it's flying past. And it has antennas to transmit its signal back to Earth. Now, this is still not something that um, would be suitable for breakthrough Starshot. Um, all these electronics are exposed. If you shone a space laser onto this, it would melt. Um, but if you could develop something that was even smaller, maybe 10 times smaller, and which somehow had the power to, with a tiny little antenna to transmit its signal from 40 trillion kilometers away um, and take a photo and all the rest of it, then you might actually have the sort of uh, uh, mini satellite that could be part of this experiment. But there are more problems to solve. Uh, and that's that even if you got the space laser and you got your tiny little probe and you accelerate it up to the 20% of the speed of light, you have another problem. And that's that uh, space is, despite its name, it's not space at all, space is not empty. Uh, the galaxy, the Milky Way, is full of dust. And when I say dust, I mean dust. I mean little grains of soot, little, little specks and flecks of junk. And you can see that in the night sky. If you go out on a dark night, you'll see the Milky Way, but you'll also see these dark patches. And these dark patches are dust clouds that are blocking out the light from beyond. You might say, well, you know, that's, that's annoying. Uh, you don't want to fly into a dust cloud, but you know, there's lots of parts of the sky that don't have dust clouds. Well, that's not true. These are only the very densest, darkest clouds. But if you look in infrared vision, you can actually see that the dust is everywhere. So this is another look at the sky using a satellite called Planck that a bunch of Canadians were very heavily involved in. And you can see that there is dust over the entire sky. So everywhere you try and go in space, there is dust. Now, if I'm walking through space at these speeds, that dust isn't going to bother me at all. You know, I might get a bit of soot in my throat or have to sort of wipe the soot off my forehead, but it's not a big deal. But if you're traveling at 20% of the speed of light, then every dust grain that hits you hits you at 20% of the speed of light. And even a microscopic dust grain wearing a tiny fraction of gram is uh, you know, a sledgehammer when it's traveling at 20% of the speed of light. So people have asked the question, well, what happens when you have a mini space probe traveling at this speed and you get hit with a dust grain? So I'm going to show you a highly technical, sophisticated calculation. Um, so uh, this is the before shot, dust, and spacecraft. And this is directly from the scientific paper. Uh, you get bad words, <laughs> bad words like crater and molten matter. Um, so uh, if this tiny little satellite gets hit by a dust grain, um, there's a fair chance that the satellite will get vaporized. So how do you get around this problem? Well, there's a few ways. One is you do not launch just one satellite with your space laser. They're tiny. Why not, you know, don't launch one, launch 100,000 of them. So the idea is you'd have this huge cloud of these tiny little uh, rice grain sized spacecraft. And you know, if 80 or 90% of them, 99% of them get knocked out by dust grains, it doesn't matter because you only need one to get to the nearest star. The other thing is you could put shielding around them. It makes them a bit heavier and a bit more complicated, but maybe the shielding will sort of slowly get blasted away by the dust grain and the spacecraft will survive. Or maybe you don't make them uh, like square, you make them like a needle shape, and that way their cross-section to the dust is very, very small. So we haven't solved this problem yet, but people are thinking about it. And uh, you know, if you go back to that fantastic vision of all of these spaceships slamming into warp drive, maybe the reality is tiny little uh, hair-sized uh, space probes dodging dust grains as they zip over to the nearest star. All right, so why do we actually want to go to these other stars? Well, the answer, of course, is because we want to see if there are aliens there. We want to see uh, if we are alone. This is the, you know, the biggest question we can ask. It used to be a philosophical question, but incredibly, it's now a scientific question. Is there anybody else out there? And of course, if, the, if there is anyone else out there, we hope that they would be intelligent, uh, and we hope that they would be friendly, like in ET or the day the Earth stood still, and we really hope that they wouldn't be mean, like in War of the Worlds or in Independence Day. So we don't know. As far as we know, we have never found any life on any other planet anywhere except our own. And uh, the reason why is because finding life elsewhere is really, really hard. Let's assume, it's not, it's, it might not be a perfect assumption, but let's assume that if there is life out there, that it comes from a planet. And maybe there's life that isn't associated with planets, but you know, our life's on a planet. So we have to find other planets. And that's really, really hard, because planets are really, really faint, and even our biggest telescopes have trouble finding them. This is a very famous photo. It's called the Pale Blue Dot. It was taken in 1990 by a spacecraft called Voyager 1 that, as it was about to leave the solar system, just turned back and just took one final photo back from where it came from. It's a photograph of the Earth from a distance of 6 billion kilometers. Can you see the Earth? 
It's that one little pixel right there. So that is the planet Earth, what it looks like from six billion kilometers away. So it's quite sobering to realize that you know, every person who's ever born and died, every happy moment, every sad moment, every sports victory, every tragic loss, every piece of music ever written, everything that anyone has ever thought is important, uh, is all happening on that one little pixel right there. So that's pretty faint. You have to know exactly where to look to see it. And that's the Earth from the edge of our solar system. If you went to the nearest star and turned back and tried to take a photo of Earth, well, that's 6,000 times farther away. And a uh, 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 physical law called the inverse square law says that the brightness goes as the square of the distance. So if you try and take a photo from 6,000 times farther away, the Earth would be 40 million times fainter than that. So I don't have to work very hard to convince you that if you made that 40 million times fainter, you would not be able to see it. What's more, if you go from far away, then uh, you know, the sun is you know, over there somewhere, but if you go farther away, then the sun and the Earth are right next to each other, and the sun is about five billion times brighter than the Earth. So put something five billion times brighter than the Earth there and make that uh, millions of times fainter, and you can see that it would just be absolutely impossible to see the Earth. So how do we find planets around other stars? There are a few cases where we can actually make pictures like this, and I'll show you one later, but... Um, the way we normally do it is a sneaky technique called uh, the transit technique. And so these planets around other stars are called exoplanets, and we can't see them directly, but sometimes their orbit is aligned such that the planet drifts in front of its parent star relative to us. And when that happens, we can't see this, we never see this, we don't have the sharpness of vision to see this, but there's the planet, and it blocks out a tiny amount of light from the star, like less than 1%, but the star just gets dimmer for a few minutes. And then as the planet moves off the other side, the star gets brighter again. So we just measure the brightness of stars very, very carefully, look for little dips in their brightness that are happening at regular times, and that is a planet going around the other star. And that little dip carries an enormous amount of information and we can actually work out the properties of these stars. So using this very simple technique, we have found thousands of these exoplanets. I looked up in the, in the database this morning, uh, the NASA database, and the current tally is 4,116 exoplanets that we know of around other stars. And the remarkable thing is that these planets are so, so different from our own solar system. So this is an animation showing you this is our own solar system. So the sun's here, Mercury's orbit, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And superimposed on that are just some of the other exoplanets that we know about. And you can see that their orbits, most of them are much tighter than ours. And they're all sorts of different ones. Some are going ridiculously fast, some are going slow, but they're all different. And most of them are much smaller than our solar system. So there's lots and lots of planets out there, and they all have very different properties from, uh, from ours. So let's go back to science fiction for a moment and say, what does science fiction say? I mean, in lots of science fiction, there's a planet just like the Earth. It's very convenient for very cheap for filming purposes, if every planet looks like California. Um, but, um, but of course, in some science fiction, there are planets that look nothing like the Earth. And so, you know, here are a couple of my favorites. Um, this is Mustafa, the planet at the end of uh, Revenge of the Sith, where um, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker have a lightsaber battle on this lava planet. Um, and he, this, strictly speaking, is another planet. It's Earth, but it's, it's very science fiction-y possibly one of the worst movies ever made, Kevin Costner and Waterworld, but he lives on a, he lives on a planet where global, global climate change has created a planet with no Earth, no land masses at all, just water. So, you know, in science fiction, we have lava planets and we have water planets. Uh, is this science fiction or is this actually some basis in fact? Well, it turns out that there aren't a lot of planets out there that we've found yet that look much like the Earth, but we have found planets made of lava. Uh, and we have found planets that are completely made of water. These are not photographs, these are artist impressions, but our best understanding is that those are the properties of the stars. So, you know, the Mustafa and water world are real. There are really lava planets and water planets. But there are things that even science fiction hadn't dreamed up. One of the most common types of planet in the universe are these hot Jupiters. Uh, these are systems that have a planet like Jupiter, but they're super, super close to their parent star. They're like 10 times closer to the star than Mercury is to our sun. And instead of orbiting in months or in years, they orbit in days or even hours. And sometimes they're so close that the heat of the star is actually slowly evaporating the planet. We've actually found planets that appear to be made entirely of diamond. And 
perhaps one of the most common types of planets uh, are these planets called super-Earths. They're planets that you know, are perhaps about the same temperature as Earth and maybe have the same conditions, but they're much, much bigger. So here is Earth, and you get these planets that are sort of Earth-like, but you know, three or four times the size. But what are the most common planets in the universe? The most common planets in the universe, uh, as far as we know, are those that are in orbit around a particular type of star called a red dwarf. Red dwarfs, uh, as the name suggests, are red and small, and they are the most common type of star in the universe. 70% of all the stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs. You might say, well, that can't be right, because I walk out on a nice starry night and I don't just see all these red stars, and that's because they're so faint. Even though 70% of all the stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs, there is not a single one you can see with your naked eye. They're everywhere. There's lots of them in our, in our 20 of the 30 nearest stars to us are red dwarfs, and you can't see any of them with your naked eye. But these stars um, are very common, and they have planets going around them. And although they're quite dim and faint, and so you might think they not, might, might not produce much warmth, if you put a planet close enough to the red dwarf, it actually produces enough heat, enough light, to perhaps make a planet livable and recognizable to us. So maybe this is the scene from a planet a bit like Earth, but orbiting a red dwarf. Um, you've got oceans, you've got a shoreline, but everything is red. There's one way in which these planets would be very, very different from Earth, though, and that's that as far as we can tell, the planets that we're finding around red dwarfs are what we call tidally locked. That means that they always keep the same face towards their parent star. Now, we see this in our own solar system. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth. The moon always keeps the same face towards the Earth. The moon is a sphere, and it has stuff on the front and the back, but you can go out always and see the moon, and it always looks the same with the same craters and the same spots because it always keeps the same face towards the Earth. We never see the back of the moon. And so uh, a planet orbiting a red dwarf uh, would be tidally locked. So one side would always be facing the red dwarf, and one side would always be pointing away. And so the conditions on a red dwarf would be very different from Earth. Uh, you never see a sunrise or a sunset. Uh, the, sun, the star never moves. Uh, if you're standing in one place, the, the, the light would always just sit at one place, never moving in the sky. So um, it would always be eternal daylight or eternal darkness. This is the side in eternal darkness. It's pointing away from the star, facing into space. And so this side of this planet would be unbelievably cold and perhaps uninhabitable. And depending on how close it is to the star, this side, face right above it, where the red dwarf is right ahead, might be very hot and unpleasant. And so it might, there might only be sort of a narrow band here, which actually is livable. This way is too hot, this way is too cold, but there's going to be somewhere uh, in a band on the red dwarf planet that might be just right. We've found these planets, and we think they're tidally locked, and maybe they look like this, but how do we actually know that these red dwarfs uh, planets actually have life on them? And that gets really, really hard. The way we could do it is to look at the color of the planet, because what happens is that the molecules that correspond to life actually block out, swallow very specific shades of very specific colors. A more technical way of saying it is if you take a spectrum of one of these exoplanets, there'll be very specific colors missing, and if the right colors are missing, that would be the signature of uh, life. And we call those signatures biosignatures, and here is a sort of a simplified version of a spectrum. So this is the brightness of the planet versus color going from uh, indigo through to red. And this is how much signal you're getting. And so you can see that there are these particular places where the colors, particular shades, like this particular shade of red or this particular shade of green, are missing. And if the right shades are missing, that means that things like photosynthesis or or methane or ozone are in the atmosphere of these planets, and to the best of our knowledge, those would be the signatures of life. So the goal is to make a spectrum, to look at the, the colors of that exoplanet very, very carefully, and see the signatures of the molecules that might correspond to life. But this is really hard. This is sort of an artist, a simplified artist's impression. If you do a computer calculation, then a real spectrum might look like this. So you can see these dips, these missing colors, due to the molecules that might correspond to life. So that's sort of what it should look like. And if you take the world's very best telescopes and you use them for incredible amounts of time, uh, you get something that looks like these black dots here. And you can see that this is pretty crude. It doesn't look anything like this. And you really don't want to say, oh, this little bump here is proof of life. It could be many, many different things. So we need bigger telescopes. We need to collect more data and get spectra to turn the quality of the data from this into this. 
And so astronomers are doing that. We are building telescopes both to go up into space and on the ground, the goal of which will be to look for these biosignatures. So one of those telescopes that will hopefully be launched next year is the James Webb Space Telescope, this enormous sort of successor of the Hubble Space Telescope that will have some capacity to look for biosignatures. And then on the ground, we're building these truly mammoth telescopes. This telescope is called the ELT, which of course stands for the Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Um, it's th the mirror is 39 meters across. You can see cars here for scale. This thing is absolutely enormous, uh, and it's being constructed right now, and it will be ready to go in about 2025, which is not that far away. And these are the telescopes that we hope will have the sensitivity to see perhaps the first biosignatures in the coming years. Now, you might be thinking, well, why are we putting all this effort into looking for life around these distant planets uh, and around other stars, because we've got all of these planets right here in our own solar system. Are there, is there any life uh, on, uh, in our own solar system besides Earth? And the answer is maybe. We know that on Earth, water is important for most forms of life. So the first thing you might ask is, is there liquid water anywhere else on the solar system? And the answer is, is that on the surface of a planet or a moon, there's perhaps only one place where maybe there is liquid water, and that's Mars, and I'll come back to Mars in a moment. But underground, there's a whole heap of moons of other, of other planets that have oceans underground. And the most spectacular one is Europa. Europa is a, uh, a moon of Jupiter, and it, as far as we know, the entire planet is enveloped in an underground ocean. And while Europa is quite small, it's only a few thousand kilometers across, its oceans are unbelievably deep. So the average depth of the oceans on Earth is about three and a half kilometers. The depths of the oceans in Europa are 60 to 150 kilometers deep. And what that means is that Europa actually has twice as much water on Europa than there is on all of Earth. So the place with the biggest oceans in the solar system is not Earth, it's Europa. We believe that that ocean is made of salty, liquid water, and that's where life began on our Earth, in the oceans. And so perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps beneath the crust of Europa, there is life. This is just uh, an imagination of what might be down there. We don't know, because we haven't been to that ocean, but maybe there is life on Europa, maybe it's intelligent, but because it's beneath the surface, it doesn't know about us, and we don't know about it. We're very keen to find out more about Europa and the conditions in that, and so there are space missions being prepared that are gonna go to Europa and check out more. One of them on the left here is this, these are both artist impressions. This is a European mission called JUICE, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Uh, it's gonna be launched uh, in 2022, and it will arrive uh, at Europa in 2029. And this is uh, a NASA mission, Europa Clipper. It's gonna be launched in 2025 and arrive in 2030. And those are going to study Europa in great detail and try and understand the properties of, of, the, of the ocean and what's beneath the crust of Europa, and perhaps also send a probe down to drill down and see what's going on. We got a surprise uh, about a year ago, uh, much closer to home on Mars, uh, that the planet that's it's not a particularly hospitable planet, but it's the one that has the conditions closest to Earth. Uh, you know, it's remarked every year around this time of year that there are many days in the year when it is warmer on Mars than it is in Waterloo. Um, uh, um, and re recently, the Curiosity rover found uh, some rocks. It broke apart the rocks and found some or what are called organic molecules, the sort of molecules that are produced as waste products by things like bacteria. So it found things like benzene and toluene and propane, these sort of molecules that, at least on Earth, are produced as a product of life. So it didn't actually find any bacteria. We don't know where those molecules came from, and maybe there's other ways to make them, but we have seen some evidence for these molecules um, on Mars, so maybe there is some very simple life on Mars. So here are all these ways of looking for life, biosignatures and molecules and the rest of it, but there's a much easier way. You can just shortcut all these steps and just say, look, if there's an alien waving to us saying hello, then the answer is yes, there is life out there. And so another thing that scientists are doing is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, and this involves listening to the sky for radio signals, looking for another, an alien actually sending a message to us. So it might be Morse code, it might be just something very simple, it might be a piece of music, it might be a message, it might be a complicated broadcast, but scientists are using some of the biggest radio telescopes on the planet to search for signals. And this is an incredible needle in a haystack problem. You don't know which star is transmitting from, and you don't know when. Maybe the aliens only transmit for one hour every century. We don't know. So you're really just hoping for the best. And the other big thing is you don't know what frequency to listen to. If I went up to you and said, oh, 
check it out, there's this really good song on the radio right now. The first thing you're going to say to me is, which station? And if I say, I don't know, then you're going to have to go through every single station on the FM and AM dial looking for my song, and by the time you get there, perhaps the song is over. Well, that's the problem we have. We have no idea what station to listen to, so you have to cycle through every imaginable radio frequency searching for that signal. So, so far they haven't found anything. They're very transparent. They release all their results, and so far it's all just non-detections. There's an established international protocol. If they do find something, uh, they will notify, they will confirm it, and they will notify the United Nations and share all the data, so it won't be some sort of alien cover-up. Um, but what might it look like at that moment? Well, in science fiction, it would look something like this. This is a fabulous movie, Contact, with Jodie Foster, all about the search for alien life. And while it's largely based on real life, Jodie Foster's character is based on a real person, uh, Jill Tata. Uh, this is the moment where she detects the alien signal. And uh, we use supercomputers to look for the signal, but of course, because it's Hollywood, she's using a pair of headphones, listening to the radio signal. And the most ridiculous thing is, a few seconds after the scene, when she detects the signal, she whips out her walkie-talkie and starts yelling to the control room, asking them what's going on. These are the most sensitive radio telescopes ever built. The last thing you want to do when you're looking for aliens is to use a walkie-talkie. It just complete that signal from the walkie-talkie would completely drown out the signal from the aliens. So this is not how we would find it, but it would actually look something like this. This is indeed an extraterrestrial signal. Uh, this is the Voyager spacecraft, which has now left the solar system. And when they are setting up for each night to go alien hunting, the first thing they do is to make sure that they can detect Voyager. So yes, if there are aliens transmitting, you could see them. And unfortunately, except for Voyager, they've never seen another signal like this. Maybe the reason why we haven't found anything yet is because everyone around the galaxy is listening. Every alien is listening and no one is actually talking. And so um, people have thought about this and said, well, maybe we should talk a bit and see if anybody else can hear us. And this is called METI, Messaging to Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It's controversial. Some people say we shouldn't be transmitting, we shouldn't be saying to aliens, hey, we're here and we're super primitive and we don't have warp drive yet, because maybe they'll say, oh, that looks like a good planet to enslave. But, um, <laughs> but people have transmitted messages. This is one of the first examples of METI. This was a signal sent from uh, Puerto Rico in 1974. And uh, because it was controversial, they decided to play it safe, and they beamed it to a star that's 25,000 light years away. So even if they get the message, and even if they respond straight away, we have 50,000 years before we have to worry about it. Um, it's a very simple message. It shows you sort of what the telescope looks like, what humans look like, the sort of a crude diagram of DNA here, and a bit of chemistry, uh, and so on. It's a very basic picture. Here's another uh, message. This was on two space probes that were launched in the 1970s called Pioneer. And there's an actual plaque that was bolted to the spacecraft. These probes have left the solar system now, but maybe one day, millions of years from now, some alien will find them, so the equivalent of the old guy on the beach with a metal detector. Um, some alien will find this thing and go, what is this? And they will look at this plaque and go, huh, they, they hadn't invented clothes. Um, but, um, so this is, this is the Pioneer. This is the Pioneer spacecraft. It's showing you how big humans are, men and women, relative to the spacecraft. Uh, but controversially, and people now say maybe this was a mistake, this is a, a chart of the galaxy showing you how to find the sun. And if the aliens find the sun, it very helpfully says, well, now you found the sun, and here we are. We are the third planet. So it's really a map saying, come and invade us. Um, the chances of these plaques ever being found is obviously incredibly small. But here is a message that's embedded um, on the Pioneer craft. The most recent space probe to leave the solar system was New Horizons. It flew past Pluto in 2015 and past an incredibly distant asteroid. Arakoff in 2019 is now heading out into the darkness. And uh, to play it safe, it has a few stamps, it has some coins, maybe they're stamp collectors. Um, you know, oh, I've always wanted one from the solar system. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, has, it has a bit of writing, a, 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 bit, a piece of a novel, which presumably the aliens won't understand, and it has the names of millions and millions of people who volunteered. It has their names uh, engraved onto a DVD. But so we are sending out this stuff, and maybe one day, millions of years from now, aliens will actually find it. Okay, so um, I hope I've convinced you that even though we don't yet have warp drive and aliens, that uh, the present and the near future are incredibly exciting. Um, I am a little bit disappointed that we don't have our jetpacks, and that we don't get to shoot uh, horrible aliens with our laser guns. But when I step back and think about it, I think you know, reality is still pretty amazing. Um, as a comparison to sort of take away your disappointment that this is not 2020, even though we were promised in the 1970s is that this is what it would look like, um, 
Uh, here is an image taken by Canadian astronomers. Uh, and so I told you it's really hard to see directly planets around other stars, but you can do it. And this is incredible. Back in 1606 or something, I forget the exact year, Galileo looked at Jupiter through a telescope and he saw the moons of Jupiter going around Jupiter in real time. He saw a little mini solar system, the moon's going around. Well, we can do that now with other stars. Here's an actual image of planets going around a, real, a star. And so this is the actual thing here from 2011 to 2016. We can actually see planets orbiting other stars. And even to me, I mean, if you would have told me 20 years ago we could do this, I'd say, no, no, no that's science fiction, we can do it. But I think perhaps to me the, the thing that's, that says we really are living in real life science fiction is the fact that right now there is a 900 kilogram nuclear powered robot that has a rock vaporizing laser traveling around Mars and if we ask it to it actually takes a selfie of itself. <laughs> so I hope I've convinced you that uh, in the words of JBS Haldane, uh, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose but queerer than we can suppose. Thank you so much.